Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Defecting from North Korea is not only a tremendously difficult and perilous enterprise, it remains a lifetime challenge, even after one has successfully resettled to South Korea. Many refugees struggle to adapt to their new life and bear a sense of longing, guilt, and sometimes even an urge to go back. Most had to leave friends and family behind, and while North Korea is certainly ruled by a brutal, ruthless regime, it remains home to those who were born there. Our guest for this episode is Yeon So Lee, who defected from North Korea at the age of 17 and eventually reached Seoul after 10 years in China, where she lived in fear of arrest and deportation. She wrote about her experience in her international bestseller, The Girl with Seven Names, and delivered an acclaimed TED Talk in 2013 that was watched over 6 million times on YouTube and TED.com. She is now an outspoken activist for North Korean refugees and has been featured in major media outlets worldwide. Hyunso gracefully accepted our interview request and talked to us about life in North Korea, her accidental decision to defect and how it changed her life, the struggle to adapt to South Korean society and economy, the sense of guilt and various discriminations North Korean defectors all too often face, and the irony of her meeting with her future husband, an American. Hyunso Lee, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you for having me. You were born in North Korea and grew up in Hesan, a city right at the border between North Korea and China. How do you remember those years? I thought that's normal life. I saw my first public execution when I was seven. I saw a man was hanging by his neck under a railroad bridge. I saw a man was shot by the authorities and his head was exploded and his brain was uh, spread all around the ground in front of his family. And I saw, you know, many people starved and was dying on the streets. Begging is not really crazy things in North Korea. And I saw dead bodies were floating down the river during the famine because I assume, you know, they were thrown into water when they were crossing the border into China. If I say like that, the South Koreans say, Oh my God, I feel like goosebumps. Is it okay for you to see all of the things? Or is that really true? People who didn't experience that environment, they couldn't understand what I'm talking. But I'm all North Korean defectors, you know. We grew up in that environment. I thought there was a normal situation because, you know, we were such cut off from the outside world. And then I thought that was the most best things we have because the regime, the government, the dictators always told us that we were the privileged human being in this world by having our, you know, first the dictator Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. They told us that South Koreans, even these days, the American pastors colonizing South Korea and then they are executing South Korean people even today. And then we learned that South Koreans, uh, you know, they didn't even have shoes during the winter. They were shivering on the streets. There's no house to sleep, you know, everything. So we learned that from the painted picture, from the textbook, from the school. So that's why I thought, wow, even though the life in North Korea, it seems a little crazy watching people dying all the time. But I feel that's, you know, normal life. And I feel that's lucky because compared to South Koreans, at least we don't have to suffer that much. I was lucky to have our first dear leader, give me some. In Korean War, if North Korea lose the game, then we would have the same situation as South Koreans have today. There are many people just curious today. Why North Koreans are so ignorant? And they have any questions about the regime? Why they live as modern slaves today, you know? They, they couldn't understand our mentality. But I'm telling them, you know, whoever grow up in the environment, no matter how you're smart or genius, you became ignorant like us. 
because you know from the moment when you were born what you see was all that environment so you believe that's the real life and then we have no comparison there's no country i could compare with my own because we never tasted what's freedom or what's democracy more over what's capitalism we never tasted that's why we just thought the socialist system was the best in the world when you were 17 you left north korea and went to china how did that happen growing up in north korea i feel still I was, you know, lucky being born there, be born in my family because North Korea is such a hierarchy. So we have uh, different classes. It's divided into three different classes from upper class, middle class and lower class. So I was born kind of upper class because my father was a military official and we didn't really suffer money, everything because the regime provided everything, including house. For us, for my family, it was a little bit paradise. Besides the brainwash or controlled by the regime so strong, you know, besides that, still we have some kind of freedom in our family with the power in the society. Because of my father's job, we would be moving many places within North Korea. And then one time, the latest year, we moved to the border town, right next to the border with China. And then growing up in the environment slowly changed my mind because uh, daytime I learned from school that even North Korea was surpassed China, everything. We just considered Chinese is a very low people, whatever, you know, we just learned to like that kind of images. But whenever I go home, you know, I see somehow between China and North Korea, there's a huge gaps every day as time goes by, you know. For example, we were suffering power shortages frequently before the famine even. When we have famine, you know, we just didn't see the lights for weeks. And then while we are living in a completely black hole across the river from my home, which is just, you know, 10 meters or 15 meters in front of me, the Chinese village is so close. They were living in a bright new world. I never saw they have a power shortages, everything. So I'm just wondered. I thought my country was the best in the world. Then why we have this power shortages every night? Why Chinese has every night? It doesn't make sense. And then at the same time, we because of living right next to border China, we could illegally watch the Chinese TV because our TV could receive Chinese TV signals but it's illegal for watching it and if the government find out that we could be you know severely punished but I was really curious about that so you know every night when my parents sleep in another room I just blocked all window with curtains thick extra blankets to prevent lights because it's a border town at night has light inside that means it's strange so the officials you know they just uh, come home immediately without just a warning so that's the system so that's why i don't want to cause any problem and i just uh, under the blanket i just uh, secretly watch the tv it transformed my life completely because uh, from the tv i just saw wow it's sh- like today, what we watching TV, it's exactly the same, you know, the advertisements, commercials, everything. I never knew that, especially the water bottles, everything can be advertised on TV. It's such different, because in North Korea, we only have one TV channels, and that's propaganda TV channel. Every day, what I heard from the TV was our dear little's name. Thousands of times, hundreds of times, Kim Il sung Kim Jong Il, and all anti slogans, all government things, what our dear little did today, or what he gonna do tomorrow, all those things. So it's such different. Although I don't understand Chinese languages, but I can see the pictures, you know, I can see somehow free than us. So that's why from that time I feel what's real. What I learned from school and what I saw from Chinese TV is such a difference. And then it caused me curiosity to find out the truth. So, you know, to find out the truth, I have to cross the border into China. I want to see China with my own eyes. I was very naive young girl, brave at the time. To find out the truth, I didn't tell my mom. 
that I'm crossing the border. Because, you know, one thing was during daytime, I saw people dying on the street. It's so painful to watch people dying. I have several really horrible memories, which I don't really want to think about many times. It bothers me sometimes. So it doesn't make sense. Even though the North Korean regime told us at the time the reason we were suffering because of only American sanctions. So every blame they put on America and then every North Korean, we hate America at the time. They put us in this situation. So nobody blamed the North Korean government at the time. I just wanted to find out the answer. And that's why I crossed the border. But the moment I crossed the border into China, I never knew that would be the last minute with my hometown. Or I would be separated from my family for so long. Or I would be, you know, hunted by the Chinese authorities all the time. And I have to hide my identity entire my life. Just, I never knew anything about that. I just wanted to find out the answer that completely changed my life. So you did not plan to defect when you crossed over to China. Before that date, did you actually think of defecting? Did you think it was a possibility? If not the famine in North Korea, I don't think I would cross the border into China. Maybe it changed my life. I think this is my fate to escape the country and to speak out against the regime about fighting with for human rights. But at the time, I was planning actually myself, not for years, but within one year. But I couldn't tell my mom because uh, at that time already some of people, they started leaving the country for starvation. But I have no reason to escape the country because many people, you know, right now who read my memoir, they told me, actually, after reading your book, I realized your life was much difficult after escape the country, not before escape the country. It's a kind of a little bit opposite compared to other defectors. So actually, certainly I had no reason to escape. But I'm not regret about the decision I made, but, but sometimes I'm also human, you know. I'm still stress anger inside because I lost everything to have this freedom you know I suffered so much over the years but somehow the stress always inside my body that I can't release ever until maybe unification until I see all people in Norsk I want to meet especially relatives and the best friends I had I shared memories with them especially I lost my family for you know, nearly 13, 14 years. I'm lucky right now that I'm living with them together finally after effort we made only a few years ago. Otherwise, I will not meet them entire my life. So whenever I'm thinking about that, I feel like I can't imagine the life after escape. But back then, 19, 1997, if by telling my mom, I know I can't proceed this project this plan so I was thinking you know come back to North Korea one week later so I wasn't think that serious because you know border town there's a many smugglers you know illegal smugglers also cross the border into China and then bring goods they are doing as a you know like business so I thought those people can do that so why not me you know that's why I took a little bit easy I didn't take that serious at the time even today, one thing that most bothered me was uh, the night I escaped the country before I crossed the border, which my mom never, she couldn't even imagine that night I'm leaving the country. After we had dinner, you know, I said to my mom, I will visit my friends and I, I will come back. And then she's just worried her daughter will be staying in the outside long, you know, late at night. So she just... Uh, came into the main gate of a house until the outside say, you know, goodbye to me. And then she said, just waving hands to me. And then she said, you know, come back quickly. Don't stay outside too long, you know, dangerous. She's talking to me with a very naive face, very pure. At the moment, you know, I know that I'm not holding my friend's house. I will be directed to the border at the time. It was thousands of thoughts racing through my mind at the moment. 
do I need to say to my mom, I'm leaving right now? Oh no, maybe my mom won't reject. But many years, you know, living in China or hiding in China, I regretted that moment because I always bothered the, my mom's face the last minute in my life. Because whenever I just imagine, oh my God, the face I saw was the could be last minute in my whole life. What if I told my mom at the time that I'm leaving, then maybe my life changed. Maybe I will not cross the border into China and that I will not be suffered this much in mentality. Everything is a very, it was difficult by separating people who didn't experience that. Maybe they can't imagine. It's different. My parents living in the United States, I'm living in other country. We meet like a few years a time. It's different. Can't compare with that because that's the country I can't never, never go back even after that. That's why it's, uh, it gives me a lot of stress and agony, everything. Many people knew that crossing the border is uh, such difficult for North Korean defectors. They have to even cross the border with their life, you know. But my situation was uh, very lucky because I was living right next to the border and then my family had a very good relationship with the border guards. So the border guards, the militaries, they're like my friends, my uncles, my elder brothers. So they even helped me to cross the border, even we to cross and then the guards, even he guided me and then, because certainly he didn't know I would not come back to North Korea. Because me, myself, I didn't know that either. So he thought I would come back. That's why he even helped, and that's why it's relatively it was easier to cross the border. But the inside, I'm not crossing normal river, you know. It's border. That's why, and then I'm going to different country where I never been to. So emotionally, it was very heavy to me. When you realized that you could no longer go back to North Korea, how did you feel? Actually, it's very shame for me to tell the truth about the emotion because uh, I frankly I wrote the thought in my memo also because uh, the moment I received a phone call from my mom from North Korea that she said don't come back to North Korea there's a long story make sure I couldn't go back and then at the moment I was a heavy because uh, yeah I thought maybe with my family will, will it be last minute I was thinking about that, but I didn't know because I never separated with my family in my lifetime. So I w- couldn't even guess the feelings, everything. I was amazed by the time already with the new world in China. Brilliant new world, you know, high buildings, you know, just uh, amazing, everything. Just uh, McDonald's, <laughs> you know, everything. So I was, was really amazed living in this community and then that's why I feel wow then I don't need to go back that means this all new world is to me maybe I can live in this society that's why I was really happy at the moment until today I'm so regret about the feeling I had at the moment I just hate myself sometimes you know because uh, I feel how you're stupid you know only few months later slowly I realized I lost something and then I realized that's my family. I miss my mom, my brother right now by that time already. And then I found the answer, oh my God, I can't go back there forever. Moreover, I miss my relatives, my friends, and my hometown, also my country. And then once I realized that until unification, it's impossible to go back, I just lived my life with the tears every night. No, people, we always, as human beings, we always live in regret. When you have everything, you don't see the values. But once you lose everything from the backward, you can realize how that was precious. Same in my situation. Until I was 17, I never separated with my family, so I didn't see the value of my family. I never imagined it could be long separation between family. But once I, after experienced, I realized this is not a joke. And then, yeah, I was torturing myself, kind of, mentally. 
reaching South Korea wasn't initially the goal for you when you went to China. When did it actually become something you thought of doing? When I arrived in China, I saw there's a lot of North Korean defectors, you know, hiding in China, and they they were dreaming to go to South Korea at the time. And then actually, I had a chance to go to South Korea because at the time, I don't know SBS or NBC journalists, two journalists wanted to take something special program project, so they want to help defectors across through Thailand from China and the, to South Korea and then they are filming all the project and then they will pay all the broker fees mean, means I don't have to pay any money at the time it was a really perfect chance the reason I didn't choose to go come to South Korea initially because uh, still I was somehow brainwashed even though living in China I see that North Korea is not the best but still you know if I go to South Korea at least it's betray my country. I never thought coming to China was a betray my country, but North Korea and South Korea is a real divided country. So once I choose South Korea, I thought this is a huge betrayal, which means it will cause huge problem to my family. It literally will kill them, everybody in North Korea. That's why I don't want to choose that way for my selfishness, you know. At the time I thought, you know, I saw some South Koreans in the past who defected to North Korea later I found actually those are all criminals you know there's no way to escape and then they escaped to North Korea so those people were appealed on a press conference in Pyongyang and then I saw through the TV their interviews and then I feel like how horrible you know that's why it reminds me when I was living in China if I go to South Korea I will be appealed same thing like a uh, vice versa I will be appealed on a South Korean press conference and then all North Korean government will be monitoring and then that's kind of advertising that I'm in South Korea and then killing my family that's why I didn't choose to come to South Korea and then in the end many years later I found out that these days at the time it was a 2004 at the time many many North Korean defectors want to go to South Korea and then because since there's many North Korean defectors in South Korea, the South Korean government does not ask for press conference publicly unless the person is really high ranking officials or famous. So that's why from that time, you know, I was slowly thinking about maybe I also can try. But the biggest reason I came to South Korea was to me, we are divided the country. I was uh, growing up in North Korea, I sang songs every day about South Korean kids to save them from the Americans' imperialists. They live as a modern day slaves. So it was my duty to save South Korean kids at the time. That That's why, you know, I just don't want to see my divided percent half to the country with my own eyes and I just want to compare I know South Korean economy was much ahead of North Korea when I was living in China but I just want to compare the propaganda I learned and the, the real life in South Korea that's why in the end you know after 10 years later I just choose to come to South Korea because even you know you want to come to South Korea from China it wasn't easy we have to take another huge risk like we crossed the border into China from North Korea it was another huge risk right in our moment lifetime but to come to South Korea was the same thing again we I have to risk with my life again that's why it was a very difficult decision to make it happen because by that time, living in Shanghai in China, my life was quite okay because I was I was working. Although I had very many difficult times hiding in China that I was caught by the Chinese police. You know, I think some Chinese friends reported me to the police station that I was a North Korean defector. So I have many horrible memories living, hiding in China because as you can see the, the girl with the seven names which is my, the title of my memoir it tells me that to survive in China I had to change my name so many times because of the horrible experience with the Chinese police. I was interrogated in front of around 30 Chinese policemen. But luckily in that situation, most of the factors will be repatriated to North Korea. But 
I was super lucky because I spoke Chinese at the time was almost perfect and then reading and writing including everything so the Chinese police couldn't believe that I was a North Korean defector that's why they released me through that horrible experience whenever I moved to the other cities between China and they move change the workplace I changed so many names so I lived with many different lives Seems it's interesting, right? But it was really hard for me to continue that kind of life. So I, many times I lost my identity myself. Even myself, who are you, you know? <laughs> you arrived in South Korea seven years ago, yet you write that, and I quote, I do not feel that I will ever fully be accepted as a South Korean. Why is that? When I arrived in South Korea, as I said in the previous answer, I took huge risk to come here. I gave up everything in China because 10 years living in China, that's another life I made myself, but I gave up everything again. And I start again my new life in South Korea. And then I thought, you know, South Koreans will be welcoming North Koreans because we've been divided country. Maybe we will miss each other for seven decades, you know? But the reality when I arrived here was completely the opposite. We are forgotten people from South Korean's perspective because we are divided for such long time. And especially, you know, they think the North Korean regime, you know, at the time Kim Jong-il period, they are doing so many ridiculous things. They know that's not normal country, normal state. So they considered all North Korean defectors like with the government equal, you know, all same crazy people, you know, all hostility, you know, everything. So I feel really disappointed because uh, even today it's happening. Many North Korean defectors, when they're looking for jobs, they are hiding their identity by saying they are Korean Chinese. And it's relatively easier to get a job than revealing their real identity. So... I was hiding my identity for 10 years in China and I feel so sick of, of, about hiding all the time. But I couldn't understand why I have to hide my identity in my motherland too. That was very painful for me to accept the reality at the time. But later slowly, you know, I began to realize instead of complaining this situation, because we were divided things for so long throughout that time, our lifestyle, culture, even, you know, languages have become different throughout that time. So to make this gap close, we need more time to get to know each other. That's what the answer I got myself. So if by succeeding in living in society, by showing those screens that North screens are also doing better, then by showing the positive attitude, everything, that means there's no words we need. That means we can make the gap close together. And then I'm so happy these days, you know, there's many North Korean defectors willing to share their story publicly, you know, including me and then on a TV, you know. So many South Koreans, when they're hearing our story, Right now, they're crying with us because after hearing our story, they realized actually North Korean defectors to come to South Korea, we gave up everything. And then we took huge risk with our life. They just realized that. And then they just cry with us right now. Also, there's many very kind South Koreans who's not revealing their names, but they are supporting you know, North Korean defectors from the behind which is very nice so uh, very kind people so yeah always there's a, this kind people and the other side people of, of course you know so i believe right now we are changing in positive direction still it exists this prejudice ice stills everything even today the north korean defector's suicide rate in south korea is higher than south koreans which is really sad I believe we are the future of unification. I came first for the unification to South Korea. So as a future unification, we have to suffer this. And then but on the same time, 
we have to do our best to make a change so that then we can finally hope the biggest unification, which is real unification between North and South Korea. In your book, you describe the prejudice that defectors face in South Korea are, and I quote, stultifying. Can you maybe go into more details, say, on a day-to-day basis, what type of interactions do North Korean defectors have with South Koreans? When we see face-to-face, people can't figure out we are North Korean or not. But because of the pronunciation, once pronunciation is different, that gives North Koreans a lot of stress that we will completely look like divided with the South Korean person and North Korean. These days, I'm more and more I feel the problem because I'm graduating my university and my friends also, they are doing their best to looking for jobs because they have to survive by themselves. But even though they graduated with really nice university in South Korea, but difficult to get a job. I can feel like my best friend in my book. I described her from China. I met long time. We came to South Korea together, you know. We went to university all together. And then even today, she just couldn't get a job. And then she's just so depressed. Whenever she's submitted the documents, you know, all just no answers or because, you know, no matter you have an English score or whatever, the problem is, you know, the salary begins with the source screens also different. So some of the North Korean students, they, they got the job right now after graduate university, but the salary, when they told me, I was really shocked. So you can receive the salary, you know, four years ago, before you go to university, without having the, you know, degree, you can receive the salary. But after you have a degree, you still have the salary, amount of salary, or less than that. Even my friend, she even she's desired to have even that salary, but she can't have because she said because I'm North Korean defector. I don't. I'm so sad about the reality. Not only her. There's a, so many university students. Look, university student has this problem. Can we guess those people who didn't even go to the universities, who's work you know in restaurants or construction sites. Even that, many people said it's not easy to find job because, uh, yeah, just uh, job problem is the most difficult. And then the other thing is because of alienation living in South Korea, because uh, we were completely ignored by the community. So already North Korean defectors, you know, lonely enough living in here because we lost all families, including relatives, especially, you know, when we encounter New Year's Day, Christmas, even today, even I have my family myself, which is lucky compared to other North Korean factors, but still I hate holidays, not only my birthday, because you know why? Holidays makes me lonely, and holidays makes me think about the past that I was spending time with my old relatives back in North Korea. Not only me, I believe my mom, especially giving her like a lot of stress. She tears every day almost to, she knows that obviously she can't go back. She's right now in 60. She will never have a chance to meet her siblings, eight siblings, you know, left her behind. Can't meet them ever because, you know, certainly in her lifetime, it's hard to we can expect that there's unification, you know. That's why I just hate holidays because especially we have right now New Year's Day, everything. I really hate these things, you know, because North Korean defect is so lonely living here. That loneliness, prejudice, everything just to, that's why the suicide rate is high, as I said. That's why, you know, many people also leaving South Korea to other country. Maybe there are different reasons or because of the prejudice here, they don't want to suffer here or many of them also go back to North Korea. It's insane. Go back to North Korea again. You just came to South Korea all the way with your life to find the freedom. And then when you encounter the real freedom, but they can't enjoy because of the society made them no freedom. Also, you know, people who never tasted freedom When they have total thousand percent freedom, they can't enjoy how to enjoy this freedom. They don't know where to go among the freedom. It brought side effects. 
And then that's why maybe the common system which they used to have maybe more easier for them. That's why they go back and that's certainly the first you know, option was to see their beloved ones inside North Korea. That's why they risk again by going back to North Korea. So it's messed up right now. It's, a, it's really sad to think about every situation. In your book, you describe the epic journey that you, your mother and your brother had through China and then Southeast Asia before coming to South Korea. But you also mentioned that your mother and your brother had times in which they wanted to return to North Korea. Why was that? Bringing my mom brother from North Korea all the way to through China, through Laos, to South Korea, it took one year long agony for us. By bringing them, I just gave up my life. I re- we released everything in China especially. We could be sent back to North Korea at the time by the Chinese police. Almost, we encountered several times in that danger time. And then I will be in public execution. There's no doubt because I was keeping source scan passport at the time. Then it's considered a very betrayer. And then my family, because of me, you know, they will be sent to the political prison camp where they can't see the light anymore in their life. It's just obviously we know the result. That's why every single step in China, when we cro- when we were crossing the China all the way to the you know Laos border to you know get to South Korea, just to literally kill us so many times. But anyway, make sure to, in the end we made it happen, right? We just came to South Korea. So I thought at the time, all the tragedy, every agony just stopped. From this moment, all happiness is left. It's just the, my mom, brother, we can live happily in free new world, you know, without stress. But I was completely wrong. Soon I found that I have to suffer more than I did before because I have to see my mom crying every day because she was missing her eight brothers and sisters that she left behind. For her, I realized she's in 60 she doesn't care about democracy or freedom you know for her the siblings that shared memories together entire her life they are the most important and same thing for my brother you know who was having successful business in north korea who never worried about the money in that situation and then came to south korea he realized that he speak perfect north korean accent and then he had to start from scratch. You know, he's nothing, you know. He went to for construction site as a worker. And then he said he's just carrying the blocks all day with the heavy things. And then he said, one day I feel like I was spinning. Oh, my body was spinning. I was almost going to faint. That he just couldn't imagine this could be my whole entire life, my life, you know. So it's not only happy for North Koreans because we are difficult to having a job here to survive feeding ourselves that's why everything it caused problem and then in the end my mom my brother they wanted to go back to north korea even though this is a really beautiful world everything's such developed but that's not for them for us it's for everyone else but for not for us we realize that so that's why i feel very guilty by seeing my mom crying every countless night, it's really killing me because it's rather suffering myself is better than, you know, watching my mom suffering. It's more killing me double times at the time. Actually, in the book, I mentioned that my, my brother, he even went to the border town right next to China. He went to himself. And then he called me the last mini phone call. He said, he was going back to North Korea right now after hung up this phone. So he even bought pants in China. Like the pants exactly look like North Korea. Because in North Korea, we can't wear jeans. So it's so visible if he wears jeans in North Korea. So he had to change the fashion. So he said he bought some darker colored pants to wear in North Korea. I know once he crossed the border into North Korea, it's finished. It's destroying his life because he has social citizenship. So he's 
kind of criminal between both countries, North Korea and South Korea. After he entered into North Korea, he couldn't even sleep safe. I know the result. That's why I, at the moment, I did my best. My goal was just put him on the airplane, come to South Korea. That's all my goal at the time. If he go back to North Korea, just all our family, everything is destroyed at the moment, you know. And then it was succeeded. And then my brother was not so stupid also, you know. He know that. He also criminals, both countries. He know about that. That's why he took on the airplane. He took airplane. And then I'm so happy for that, you know. Many people who read my memoir, many people ask me, you know. They feel really sympathy for my brother and my mother who never suffered in North Korea and then they suffered more after they escaped the country like me. And then they ask me, how's your mom these days? How's your brother? Are they really okay even today? You know, I just wish they are all happiness, everything. So I'm proudly I'm answering for that. I say, yeah, my mom still, she's uh, doing her best to, you know, erasing the memories in North Korea which is impossible, I believe, but my brother, I'm really proud of my brother. He's doing very well. Last month, he went to Columbia University to start new semester next year. So he was accepted by one of the most prestigious university. And then, yeah, he's starting studying there as a student. So I'm so proud of my brother, you know, who never knew about any English A, B, C, D until come to South Korea. And then once he changed his mind that he couldn't go back to North Korea, then he needed to make a change in his life. Otherwise, you know, there's nothing, you know, he can be just normal. He can suffer whole entire life. And then he did study a lot over the years. Just over two, three years, he just killed himself in studying. And then finally accepted by Columbia University. So I'm so happy for his big success. Today, you're married to Brian, an American, and therefore, using what you used previously, an American bastard. Did the North Korean discourse on Americans ever affect your relationship with Brian? Actually, in my book, the ending was many people never expected. You know, many people mentioned on the Amazon, on the book review, it's just a surprising ending and then satisfying. It's just a... But when I start dating with Brian, because we learned in North Korea, Americans, we never learned as Americans. We have one word, American bastards or American enemies. That's one word. We never learned as just American. That's why when I introduced Brian to my mom and brother for the first time, they were speechless. Of course, they can't speak English. That's why they couldn't have any conversation. But I can see their face just uh, completely dark. They say no words at all. And then my brother, actually many years later, he confessed to me. He said, I couldn't imagine that you brought the American pastors at home at the time. But, you know, I respect your choice. So I couldn't mention that. It seems too rude. But my mother different. At the time, my mother, after Brian went back, my mother said to me, you know, wow, I must live in this world too long by this time, too long. So I said, what do you mean suddenly? I said, and then she said, I couldn't imagine, you know, eating dinner with American pastors in one table. I think over the time, you know, I was living in China for many years, so slowly maybe the images of American pastors, it's somehow, you know, it's came less to me. But when my mom told me saying that kind of words, it reminds me, oh my God, yeah, they are so brainwashed to human being in this world. And they, they just came from North Korea only one year ago, you know, maybe for them really hard to expect their, accept the reality. And... Uh, yeah, so my mom, actually, you know, I'm confessing here. My mom did her best to separate Brian and me. She said, you can find much better husband or boyfriend than Brian, you know. Just to finish the relationship, you know. She did her best. I think she just hated at the time, hated Brian. Because not because of the person, because he was American pastor. 
And then as time goes by, she was also slowly awakened from her brainwash. And then she realized Americans are very actually kind, you know. So in the end, she accepted all marriage. So we married one year ago. And then for the marriage, we went to America. We had wedding ceremony in America. And then it's so funny that in North Korea, we are not allowed to have a passport as a North Korean citizen. So more than 99% of North Koreans never saw what it looked like, the passport. So when she received the passport in South Korea, not only my mom, every North Korean, we were so emotioned. This is like a proves that we are a normal human being. Finally, I have a voice, you know. The funny thing is, on her passport, she only visited the foreign country one time after she came to South Korea. It was America. So there's a huge big America stamp on her passport. So I feel she hated growing up. She was taught to hate Americans as animals, not humans. But there's a big one American stamps on the passport. And then when she went to America, she just loved the nature so much and then she's just amazed by the people's kindness everything you know she thought americans are all like uh, just a uh, animal you know not human like uh, but she don't say that much words but i can feel she just uh, really like to be in america or i mean everywhere she like everywhere but especially because you know we learned americans are not human and then that's why my friend, North Korean friends, many friends, when we are talking together, like, uh, they ask me, where's your American pastors, you know? What is the pastors doing these days? So all words, every time they use American pastors. So this is using as a joke, I know. So it's kind of funny, but yeah. It's sometimes I call my husband myself, your American pastors, you know? <laughs> yeah, like that. You wrote a book about your story as a defector. You spoke at a TED conference as a defector, and you even spoke in front of the United Nations as a defector. Do you ever see this role of being a defector as a burden? The life I have right now, I kind of, I speak against the regime. It's more bringing dangers for my personal security issues, everything. By doing this work, you know, I'm happy because, uh, not doing this for myself, it's for North Korean people. Because uh, I believe in my lifetime we will have a unification. And then certainly, you know, I believe that somehow I can feel like the people from North Korea, in the end, later, they will ask me, when we are suffering under the dictators inside the first prison, what did you do for us living in free world? So I was thinking I have to, to have some answers giving them some answers so that to giving them the answers i have to do something proud myself for them you know that's why i'm keeping this but this situation right now you know no screens we we were suffered under dictators for seven decades and they live inside a huge cave and then the North Korean people inside the cave they're yelling to us you know just to please save us but we can't hear outside because it was a huge deep cave. We can't hear. So I'm a, as a North Korean defector, you know, I'm just uh, helping, spreading their voice, you know, to ask help to international community so that we can make a change in the end. It's right. That's why I'm doing this work. But on the same time, I feel, is it really me? But anyway, the name I have here in Seoli also not my real name. It's my seventh name. So I've been changing my name so many times in my life, which means so many different lives. And still, some friends I used to know in the past in China, they all knew me with different names, you know. It's kind of a tragedy for me, you know. So even though this work I'm doing is a little bit tough, but sometimes I feel, you know, Wow, did I sometimes give him happiness, you know, even though it's such dangerous because I was targeted by the North Korean regime after I gave a TED talk, but moreover after my book published right now. But then in North Korea, when I was growing up there, did I ever, ever imagine that I would be against all dear leader hugely publicly? The answer is no, it's impossible. 
you know, living in North Korea, if you complain about any single world to regime, any people will be killed and disappeared in the middle of the night to the political prison camp and, uh, you know, just even call the dictator's name, their leader's name, we can't call their name itself. We have to put their something, titles behind or in front of their name. So how can I even imagine, you know, against them publicly? So what I'm doing right now is uh, I'm the victor from the system. So that's why I will keep doing this until the regime collapse or until they're willing to show they want to do some change, bring economic change or better human rights situations in North Korea. I believe we give a lot of precious in the end, the main key is China, certainly. If China just to do some serious sanctions, they will change North Korea. I mean, not hugely, but it's, you know, one step, one step, gradually they will change. So that's what I'm aiming for doing right now. You mentioned initially that you were happy growing up in North Korea. Have you ever felt that this was not okay to say in South Korea, that it didn't fit the normal discourse on North Korea? Yeah, sometimes, you know, people want to hear more crazy story or sensationalized story. But in my memoir, I frankly told every story, you know, because in North Korea also, there, that's the place where human being lives. There's also, you know, as I mentioned the previous answers, there's upper class, lower class we have. So there are also rich people but the difference is compared to outside, most people are poor, just a lot, maybe 80% is poor people. That's why North, we had a big famine in North Korea. So I want to show people there's a many different variety of life in North Korea exists. That by telling the truth is the only way to make a change. There's a many different suffer stories, you know. So what many people right now are saying to me, yeah, your book is different compared to other starvation or gulag or those stories. But from your book, we really learned about North Korea a lot. From the girl's perspective who never suffered. And then in the end, still, I choose to leave the country because uh, although, you know, that's accidental defection, you know, but I defected and then I bring changes. I brought my family up many years, more than 10 years later. And because I want to show them, you know, beautiful new world, everything. I risked my life. And then even I'm sitting here today giving an interview, but I don't know what's going to happen to me tomorrow because we are living in same period right now. But as a North Skin defector, I have no guarantee because I'm living in different worlds. Still, I feel I'm living in a war. As long as my, you know, relatives stay in North Korea, you know. So I'm just scared. I'm praying for nothing happen any for me, any bad things, you know. Only just to give me some, you know, safe time, you know. Yeah, just I just hope for that. You have become one of the most prominent defectors from North Korea in the global media. Do you know how other North Korean refugees uh, in South Korea perceive you, perceive your role? So many people who I know or who I don't know, they send me through, you know, either my phone text who I, I know or just through Facebook, the defectors. They say that they are so proud of me because what I'm doing is... Exactly, it's a mirror. It's for North Korean defectors' face, and then giving them, uh, you know, courage to do more. They many defectors also ask me the solutions. You know, I'm in this problem, so what's your advice? So you know, I'm a, as a North Korean defector. We just experienced all process, the agony they have right now, or I experienced, or even I have even today. I'm fighting myself so I can give them uh, the feedback or advice with my hurt with the experience so to never give up make sure to never give up I think the life is you know fair so even though today you are having very difficult life but if you do your best one day I, I believe not that long later you can have a better chance 
that was my experience. I wanted to give up many times. Seriously, I wanted to give up and I wanted to go back to China or moreover, I maybe wanted to go back to North Korea, seriously. But I never gave up and then I did my best. And then, yeah, I don't say I had successful life, but still, you know, I'm satisfied that success I made myself over the time within, within such short time. So I'm giving them a lot of courage. Yeah, so I'm happy that I can be help somebody. To send us off, could you maybe read an excerpt of your book to us? Last month, during the UN Security Council meeting, when they're talking about North Korean human rights issues, the South Korean ambassador, Oh Jun, he mentions this quotation from my book. And also, I really loved this quotation from in the past. Even though this is a very short sentence, but it describes exactly the defectors living in South Korea or hiding in China as a defector, you know. So I'm going to read this sentence. Living in North Korea is not living in any other country. It's more like living in another universe. I will never truly be free of its gravity, no matter how far I journey. Hyun Seo Lee. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.